Manscaped has the men's grooming market down pat. Their Lawnmower 4.0 is the most revolutionary body hair trimmer on the market. They also have amazing products like their Crop Reviver, their Crop Preserver. They have a new body wash. They have a new shampoo and conditioner. They have a nose and ear hair trimmer. They have a cologne. Manscaped is really the one-stop shop for all your men's grooming needs. So go to manscaped.com and use code HRU for 20% off plus free shipping. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. I have a really interesting interview today. You may have heard my interview with Nicole Mitchell a while back. She was uh, a pastor who then turned to OnlyFans um, and left the church. I have somebody who's kind of done the whole full circle thing. I have Crystal DiGregorio, aka Naughty Hilton. She was a porn star. She left porn. She joined the church. She became a pastor. And then she she left the church and she's back doing porn exclusively on her OnlyFans. So I've never had anybody who's kind of done the full shuffle. And I'm so I'm really interested to hear about her journey and why she's made the decisions that she's made. So let's welcome Crystal, aka Nadia. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Hi, I'm great. I'm so excited to be here. I'm so excited to have you. Um, thank you so much for coming on. Like I was saying, this is like a really interesting story. Um, so I guess let's start from the beginning. How did you get started in the porn industry initially? What made you make that leap into porn? Um, well, you know, it's kind of, you know, you just open one leg and you open the other. I'm joking. <laughs> um, <laughs> a lot of people ask me, that's like literally my typical joke. Spread your legs. <laughs> um, no, when I first came out to, I uh, went out to LA, moved out to LA. I uh, went out there for mainstream acting. I wasn't even um, interested in doing porn. And then, you know, I found out how much it cost out there. And then kind of uh, it rolled into all that. Um, and then, you know, obviously it's the, the way of the world. The more money you make, the more you're spending and kind of get stuck in that routine of it. Mm hmm. Yeah. I've lived in LA my whole life and I can absolutely relate. I think a lot of people <laughs> don't understand how expensive it is to live here. So, um, I mean, how did you like, did you answer like a casting call in a newspaper? Actually, I'm no, um, dating myself who reads newspapers. <laughs> like, <how did> you... <laughs> um, no, I actually had this agent, uh, that was contacting me. He actually was started contacting me. He saw me in FHM ma magazine. Mm -hmm. contacted me then asked me if I would um was would be interested in doing porn and I was like no um and then uh, I ended up I moved from New York to North Carolina for a while and he he kept basically in contact with me and was like you know if you want to do nude modeling I'm like yeah definitely I'd be interested in that um because he he uh all of his his clients have uh you know, or like Penthouse Hustler, Vivid Wicked, all of them. And he's like, you know, I can get you into magazine work if that's what you want to do, or I can get you into porn. And I was like, no, <laughs> until I moved out to LA, that's when I decided, you know, I would, I would try it. And uh, he's like, he's like, yeah, you can make $30,000 a month. And I was thinking, oh, I'll just do it for a couple of months and be done with it. But mm -hmm. I very easily got sucked into it. <laughs> yeah. I kind of say, I kind of jokingly say, but it is true. Porn is like the black hole. You have to move faster than the speed of light to get out of it. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, first of all, it's, you know, it is kind of easy money, especially at the beginning, you know, if you're attractive and you're, and you're good at it. Um, and then second, the stigma that comes with it makes it hard to do anything else afterwards. So I think that that um, kind of ends up trapping people in porn. And I say trapping like it's a, it's a bad thing. And I think I'm really only referring to people who enter in unfortunate circumstances, have a bad first experience, find that they're not really suited to it, and then have a hard time getting out because the porn industry definitely isn't for everyone. That's for sure. Um, 
So you describe your first porn shoot as traumatic. Can you tell us about that shoot and and what it was like? My first shoot was just, I wasn't ready for it mentally, you know, physically, everything, my body. I just, I wasn't, wasn't ready for it. I mean, before I got into porn, I was not the girl that slept around. I, you know, had one boyfriend all throughout high school. I was, you know, I didn't date very much. So going into it, you know, I'm having sex with somebody that I didn't know. And um, that scene, the guy actually came twice during the scene. And I was like, this isn't right. This can't be happening. Um, So like, I was pretty annoyed that it went on and on and on and just felt dirty. You know, when I, when I got all um, done with the scene, um, I remember sitting in the shower for about two hours, just like crying. I mean, I remember the water being freezing cold by the time I got out of the place and it was just, it it was just, it was a terrible, terrible experience. I mean, the guy was nice. The directors were nice. Everybody was great and everything. It was just, you know, I mentally just wasn't ready for it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I can, I can absolutely understand that. You know, like I said before, it's just, it's definitely not a job for everybody. And, you know, it's always a good idea to kind of start slower. So you said that you were, he first offered up like solo girl magazine work. Did that never materialize? Oh, no, it did. It definitely did. I mean, I did a ton of uh, regular modeling work. It just, I wanted to make more money and, um, you know, the, you know, I just, I kind of got stuck into the whole routine of it. I was like, it became very easy for me to do it. Um, you know, I had, at the time I was having like cysts on my ovaries that were hurting. So having intercourse hurt. So mm-hmm. I went to the doctor and there was this doctor out in LA and he would just literally prescribe me whatever I wanted. So he was prescribing me hydrocodone pills. So what I was doing was taking that. Is he the, is he the doctor that everybody goes to in the porn industry? Um, I don't know. Cause I, I literally just, just looked up a doctor and okay, were, there's, went to one. There was one, there's one specifically, I won't say his name, but he's like the guy that everybody, I don't even know if he still works anymore, but he's like, the doctor that everyone in porn goes to. And apparently he will prescribe you anything. Yeah. Well, this doctor did. I mean, he was just like, yep, write your prescription. And when every month I'd get a prescription and, um, I would go on set and people had no, no idea that like I had orange juice bottle that you'd buy from a gas station. I would fill half of it with like vodka just to enhance it. And Mm -hmm. I would literally go on set and do my shoot and not even, you know, that got me to a point where mentally I could handle it and my body wasn't hurt and there was you know, I was fine and I would, you know, just take the one pill in the morning and then by the afternoon I was fine and off my day. Like it was a nine to five job. <laughs> yeah. So how did, so is that how you kept like working in the adult industry after that first traumatic experience you got through it with like the pills and the alcohol? Yeah, definitely. I, um, you know, there, there was definitely a lot of times where I didn't, um, take, take the pills, but, um, or drink. Um, but you know, it was, it, I would have to be working with somebody that I was attracted to and had known beforehand or something like, um, Oh my God, Nick, I can't even remember his last name, but there was one of these guys that uh, was on set with me and he, I would work with him all the time. I'd never have to take anything. He would just, it was just like a natural thing for me. W- was that Nick Manning? Yeah. Nick Manning. <laughs> the drop and like- loads guy. <laughs> It, it, wait, is it? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he he was uh, modeling for Calvin Klein <laughs> before. Yeah. yeah, he was a he was a very attractive man, but he his thing I think was like kind of, and he went on Howard Stern and they made a huge deal about it. And he would say drop in loads every time like he came, and yep. you couldn't get him to not say it. Like he yep. wouldn't not say it because I shot him a few times. I'm like, can you not say that? And he was like, no, that's my thing. And I was like, okay. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, I shot him for Playgirl, actually. Yep. I did too. Yeah. Same thing. That's um, so, okay. So, so then you continued on. Did, did it ever get like better for you or did you really feel like this was just an industry that you were trapped in and you really just like couldn't get out? I, I can't say that I was, um, it was something that I fully got used to because I never liked the idea that I had to go on set and film with somebody that I didn't like, didn't, wasn't attracted to. I mean, there were a couple of people that were on my, you know, blocked list. Finally, after shooting with them a couple of times, I was like, nope, never again. 
So I didn't like that aspect of it. Like I had no control over who I was working with. Mm -hmm. So um, that was the only part I felt like really trapped in. And then before I got into the whole church aspect of all of my life, um, I had to file bankruptcy to get away from that. You know, I had a multi-million dollar mansion, a, a nightclub, a Ferrari, you know, two Escalades. It's like the only way for me to walk away from everything is literally, you know, walk away from it, drop it all, and walk away. So you got all of that with your porn money? Yeah, oh yeah, everything. Wow. So you really were making a lot. And this is before, you know, these personal content platforms, which I know you're on now, like the OnlyFans, which we'll get to, mm -hmm. where girls are really making a lot of money. So you were making all that money just like performing for studios. Is that right? Yeah. I, and it was, you know, like I didn't shoot a ton of videos. It was like I would shoot maybe five videos a month and then I would feature dance. I'd be stripping and mm -hmm. stripping was just huge money maker, Huge. Yeah. Did um, you enjoy yeah. the stripping versus the filming movies? I definitely love performing. I definitely love that sexual aspect of it. And, you know, just that, you know, being that girl up on stage that everybody kind of came to the club to watch and stuff. And I, I loved it. I love that whole doing the pool tricks, everything about that. I loved. Yeah. So how do you think that, um, I mean, you know, obviously you know, so far you've got kind of like a, like a sad story when it comes to the adult industry, which, you know, everybody has a different story. Um, do you think that there's a way that you could have had a better experience at, at a, the beginning? Like are there things that you would do differently knowing now what you know? Um, I think I, I wish I had more confidence in myself to have control over the contracts that I signed, mm. um, you know, making it known that, you know what, I'm only going to shoot with these people and that's it. Instead of just, you know, being the girl, you know, that anybody you can hire for. So hustler would hire me and then I could shoot with four or five different guys. I wish I had more control over that. And mm. I, back then I was, you know, it's, it's kind of sad to say, but like I was, I was more shy. I mean, even being on porn, like I was shy, I was a shy person and, um, I let other people have power over me. So yeah. I wish back then I would have had more power and more confidence in myself to, you know, look at it into it and say, no, I'm not doing that. I'm not shooting that. I'm not doing that in a film. And, yeah. but still, that's why I love OnlyFans because it's like, I can control it. Yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, OnlyFans has changed <clears throat> the entire landscape of porn. And like I said, we'll, we'll definitely get to that. Um, how old were you when you started doing porn? I was 19. Okay. So young. So, I mean, setting boundaries is something that's difficult for all of us. You know, I have a hard time setting boundaries and I'm 43. Um, I definitely <laughs> wasn't good at setting boundaries at 19. Um, so do you think that there's something to be said from because I know that there are some people who definitely believe that getting into porn, you should be older, that 18, 19, 20 is too young. How do you feel about that? Um, I think you don't really know who you are at that age. It's like you're still learning. Mm -hmm. So I would definitely say if somebody's getting into porn, um, I would say, you know, learn out who you who you are. You know, make sure you have the full confidence in yourself and the strength to control yourself because the problem is, is everybody thinks they're going to be the next Jenna Jameson. And then when they go to an agent and then they're shooting, 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 and then the boy girl content that they're doing uh, isn't working. It's not making them famous. They're just, you know, another girl that comes in and leaves. Then they start doing more. They start doing, you know, all the crazy things that happen in the porn industry. And then, you know, they get used up and shipped out. And that's why I, I would just say with anybody that's getting into porn, like have more control over yourself because that's really the only way you're going to have that self-respect and that, you know, worth when you get older. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, back then when you started, it was, you know, easier said than done, right? Because you needed those bookings. You needed that work. You needed the studios to hire you in order to survive. Um, whereas now, you know, girls have way of making money independently and it's, you know, things are, are different and, and better, I think. Um, so you abruptly left the porn industry in 2014. Was there anything specific that happened that made you just kind of drop everything? 
Um, that was when I had my saving experience in church. I was going through a, a horrible, horrific, um, abusive relationship. And, um, I was basically in the middle of getting out of it and then finally out of it. And like, I had this like draw to this guy that was, he was a complete narcissist and, um, just asked God to like remove me from that relationship. And that day I got saved, it was like, never, never thought about him ever again. It was just amazing. No, tell me a something little, I can never explain. Tell me a little bit more about like being saved. Like, what do you mean by that? What was the exact like scenario there? Well, like back then I'll, I'll just say like, now I have two, I have different views on what's being saved and what isn't saved. Like back then it was like pulling the veil from my eyes, making me see the world in a different light that I didn't see it before, you know, pulling me like out of the porn industry and seeing like all these things. Like, well, I would walk out of the house and I would not walk out of the house without full on makeup, you know, showing cleavage, showing my belly, wearing high heels. Like I had to be that porn star look that that was like me all the time, bleach blonde hair, everything. And then when I got into the church, it was, it was like, um, totally different. Girls couldn't wear jeans. Girls had to wear skirts. You couldn't cut your hair, couldn't dye your hair. Um, you couldn't show your shoulders. You couldn't show cleavage or wear really tight clothes. It was extremely strict. So that, that was my view of, of being saved, you know, not, I stopped swearing. Um, I started going to church all the time, started reading the Bible all the time. It was a totally different experience. But now what I view as say, being saved now is completely different than what I saw back then. Yeah. So you joined a Pentecostal church, which is, like you just said, very conservative. Um, you talked about no alcohol, skirts below the knee, you know, not bearing the shoulders. Um, there's a lot of denom denominations of Christianity that don't have those kinds of extreme rules. So what was it about the Pentecostal church specifically that made you gravitate towards them? So, um, my parents' house where, where uh, my parents live across the street was the church I got saved in because my sister went to church there. So that's where I learned, you know, the whole Pentecostal way was, was mm. in that church and that was a uh, United Pentecostal and it was extremely strict. Um, I had gone to a couple other chur churches. They weren't as strict, but you know, they would constantly be preaching down on gays and, um, uh, a lot of, a lot of the, you know, the going out to bars is a sin, you know, being gay is a sin, like all these things, which absolutely like literally made my stomach turn. It was, mm. it just disgusted me the how bad. Cause it was like, you know, I have attraction towards women. So, so sitting here telling me that, you know, I'm going to hell for my attraction and then watching gay people walk into the church and literally walk right back out because the pastor's preaching against gays. Like it just disgusted me. So, right. you know, it's like each church is going to have their own restrictions, whether it's going to be on clothing or, you know, drinking alcohol or being against, um, you know, gays or whatever. There's always going to be something there in each each world of, of religion mm -hmm. that, that, I, that I've ever seen. You know, maybe there's more right. out there, but... <laughs> <laughs> So you, you said you face a lot of judgment, um, from the people in your church. Uh, what did that look like? Oh my gosh. Um, so the church I was pastoring, I had, you know, tons of people that would come into the church that, you know, didn't judge me. You know, you can come into my church with full on piercings and tattoos and everything. And they, those people knew, like I took them as they are not, it didn't matter. You didn't have to dress up to come through the doors. You could be, you could come as you are. Um, it was when I went to other places, like I would go to other churches while I was a pastor and just kind of sit in the congregation and listen and just the judgment of people. Cause I was very, I I'm, I'm very well known around here and people knew who I was. So it was, you know, like people would say hi and be all smiley to my face. And then all of a sudden, you know, they turn around and then they're like, Oh my God, she's a porn star. She's a girl that had sex on film. And you know, it was just, it was terrible. Like I, um, my skirts, sometimes they started judging me by the, you know, how, how tight my skirts were. And so it was just every little thing, you know, they were just little nitpicking on every little thing that I was doing. Mm. So you, when you joined the church, you didn't like just become a member of the church, you became like a pastor. 
So, so what motivated you to take that, like to take the stage basically? Um, my ex was, uh, pastoring a different church and he got, um, his church taken away from him when we started dating because he was dating a porn star. (laughs) So, um, that was more of his dream and his calling. I would say mine was, I love to help people, you know, my whole pastoring experience. Um, I would put 40 hours a week into this place and, you know, I never got paid for it. It wasn't that type of church at all. Neither one of us got paid. We did it out of helping people and the love for people. So that was my drive. My drive was, you know, helping people and seeing the difference changing in people. What I didn't like about it was, you know, having church members pick apart each other and -hmm. judge each other for their sins. Once everybody finds out about it, it was like this little gossip community. Yeah, that's kind of almost inevitable in any like kind of tight knit community, right? I mean, people just can't help it. Did yeah. you, when you were pastoring, did you talk a lot about your, your past in porn? Like, did you, did the church kind of use you as an example about being saved from like a sinful industry at all? Um, it definitely did. They, they, uh, you know, that was a lot of, a lot of the reasons why the people loved me so much is that they, you know, they saw that I went from one extreme to the next. Um, but <laughs> it wasn't the focus of it. You know, like when people come into and I would preach, I would preach on depression. I would preach on so many different things, even stuff that I didn't even have any experience with. I would research different topics and preach on other stuff. Right. Right. Um, so has the experience, your experience in church, like changed your views on pornography? Oh, my views are completely changed. I, um, you know, being in church, I was starting to see myself become judgmental towards people, you know, and I didn't like that. I didn't like how it was changing me. You know, I got, I got so, um, obsessed with the fact that I was showing something like my shirt would be like, like this. And I would be freaking out and like, want to wear a scarf, you Mm -hmm. know, because I wanted to just be covered up. I felt so ashamed and I'm, and I'm like, this can't be right. You know, this can't be what God wants for us. We don't want us to be ashamed. We were born into this world naked, you know, so it shouldn't matter. Uh, Being naked shouldn't matter to anybody because that's how we were born. That's how God made us. Mm -hmm. So it definitely, there's, there was a lot of stuff that made me change because I just, I was this open person that just loved life, was happy and everything. And then I got to a point where I was just listening to sad, depressing um, Christian music and just becoming judgmental. And I didn't like anything about that at all. Right. It's interesting how it's like kind of these two extremes, right? I mean, you, when you were in porn, you said you couldn't leave the house without full makeup, cleavage, belly shirt. And then when you were in church, you like had to have everything totally covered up. It seems Mm -hmm. like for me, and, and I guess we'll, we'll know more at the end of your story, but like, I think you, like so many of us are always trying to find that, like that middle road. Right. You know, but like, sometimes we're just pulled to these extremes. Like I'm definitely somebody who's, who's always fighting to, to be in the middle. And I, I definitely get pulled in, you know, extreme this way, extreme that way. Um, do you see that that's kind of your journey too, like finding that, that peaceful middle road? That's where I'm at now in my life. It's like, I've seen the full on side of porn. I've seen the good, the bad and the ugly with porn. And I've seen the same thing when it comes to religion. So now Mm -hmm. I see myself like I'm right in the middle. I, you know, I only shoot with uh, my husband and, you know, my porn life is healthy. It's not, you know, I'm not having sex with somebody that I didn't want to have sex with. Mm -hmm. And with church, it's like I go to church when I want. I can pray when I want. I still have a strong relationship with God and I still believe 100 percent God loves me as he does everybody else in this world. You know, I don't, I don't have that. Um, you know, I'm not all in on one and all in on the other. It's like, I'm right in the middle and I'm, I'm like happy. I'm, I'm good where I'm at. Yeah. All right, guys, we're going to take a quick commercial break and then we're going to come back. We're going to talk about crystals leaving the church, coming back to the adult industry and where she's at now. So hang tight. We'll be right back. 
If you've been a longtime listener of my podcast, then you've heard me talk about Manscaped. And I'm going to keep talking about Manscaped because it really is the best men's electric body trimmer out there. Their new Lawnmower 4.0 has advanced skin safe technology that will help eliminate nicks, snags, and cuts. But that's not all Manscaped is offering. They've also introduced body wash infused with aloe vera and sea salt to keep your whole body smelling and feeling great. And they have shampoo and conditioner guaranteed to hydrate and keep your hair staying strong. So guys, if you want to clean up your act, make sure that you check out Manscaped and all their amazing products that they have to offer. And better yet, you can get 20% off plus free shipping when you go to their website, manscaped.com, and use code HRU for your special offer. That's manscaped.com. Use code HRU for 20% off plus free shipping. All right, guys, we are back. So Crystal, what made you decide to come back to porn? Like what was the straw that broke the camel's back and, and got you to leave your position in the church and come back to the adult industry? Um, well, when I left the church, it was, I went through a bad divorce and, um, had a lot of seriously evil things happen to me. Um, and that's a whole other show in itself, but, yeah. um, basically, uh, had my house robbed and basically stolen custody of my son, one of my kids. Uh, it was a horrible, horrific thing I went through. Um, some serious government corruption, like somebody needs to make a movie about that stuff I went through. It's, it's crazy. But after going through all the divorce and everything that I went through, um, I kind of stepped back away from church because I went from going through a divorce and was going to church three, four times a week for a while. And then people in the church, because I'm the porn star and my ex was um, a pastor or he got actually got voted out and they wanted me to pastor the church by myself. And I said, no, but um, they started saying, oh, she, you know, she's a whore. She must've cheated on him. That's why they went through a divorce and everything. Well, Come to find out after um, going through everything and uh, for them knowing all the truth and he ended up walking into the church with the girl he was cheating on me with. On, with and um, the truth came out that I was being a good wife and he was not being so good. Wow. <laughs> and um, so I end up um, end up getting remarried um, for, to a guy that I went to high school with. And... Um, one of my friends started OnlyFans and she was telling me about it. And I was like, yeah, why not? You know, like I'm, I'm a sexual person. I love being sexual. I love, you know, being, um, having that power over my body and everything. And so that's why I got into it. Yeah. I mean, and, and now you can come in on your own terms, right? You don't have to, you know, like the old Nadia Hilton who first came in, who had to work with people that she didn't want to, had to do things that she didn't want to do. I mean, that's completely changed. So, I can imagine that your experience is drastically different. It's yeah, it's, it's definitely completely different. I, you know, like porn back then when I was shooting with somebody that I didn't want to shoot with, it was 100% acting. There was no having an orgasm or anything like that. And now it's like, it's real. It's me. It's not the craziness of the fake world of acting when it comes to porn. It's like 100% real. And I love it and I'm having fun doing it. Mm -hmm. How else is OnlyFans different for me, for you versus like when you were performing? Is it like the fan? I mean, I'm sure is it, I won't say it's, is ask if it's the money because, you know, (laughs) that's that's a part of it. We're all here to, uh you know, pay our bills. Right. But yeah. Do you, is it like the fan interaction? I mean, you just said that, you know, the control of your own content is good, but is there anything else about, only fans that really has made it a different experience for you. I love the one-on-one interaction that I have with people. You know, I answer all of my messages myself um, and just talking with people. And if somebody wants like a specific video or a specific picture, it's like, I get to fulfill that, you know, fantasy for them where mm-hmm. before it's like, you know, they have to go to a porn store and, or, you know, pull a DVD off the shelf or Google me on Pornhub to, 
watch a video. And now it's like, okay, I can watch the video and I can talk to her and tell her what I like or what I didn't like. So I love that aspect of it. Do you get people who come to you who also like grew up in the church or were a part of the church and had a lot of guilt around their sexuality? Um, do people ever relate to you on that, that aspect? Yeah, I get a lot of, I get a lot of that. I get a lot of, um, women that are, you know, uh, bisexual or, or fully gay and talking about how, you know, they felt so much shame and they, they became really depressed and, and, you know, like I talk to them and just tell them, you know, how much they're loved and not let the views of people put them down because that's not God. People are not God. They're just people. Mm -hmm. So how you, I mean, you kind of mentioned briefly that, um, you know, you have a different, you're still, um, you know, you still somebody who believe, believes in God. Um, can you tell us like how your relationship with religion and maybe with God has, has changed now? Like something like a little bit more specific, like, do you still go to church? Um, are you specific about where you go? Is there like things that you take and, and leave when you go? You know how like sometimes when you listen to somebody preach or there's some things that you're just like, no, 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 I'm not going to, I'm not going to take that with me. Um, but I'm going to take these pieces. Does that make sense? Yeah. I, I go to a church now. Um, I don't go like I used to go, like I said, three, four times a week. And now I probably go once a month. And sometimes I, I'll go a couple months without even going because mm -hmm. I don't want somebody's view and somebody's, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> somebody's view of the Bible to be my view. You know, mm -hmm. everybody interprets things differently and, in the same way, I don't want somebody to control my mind that way. I will read stuff or listen to stuff and take on what I want to take on now instead of it being this judgmental thing. Because if I go to go to one church and I'm listening to the same type of sermons all the time, if somebody it is if it's somebody that's against gays, it's going to be drilled in my head over and over and over again. It's like I don't want to listen to that because I'm not against gays. I'm you know bisexual myself. So. Mm -hmm. um, I go to a church that is more based around love and just loving people and accepting people for who they are. And, um, it's just, it's different for me now. It's like, I feel more love now than I did before. Mm -hmm. What do you see? So I'm sorry. I'm just always interested in, in this and religion. Cause I was raised an atheist. Um, <laughs> so like, I don't understand what it's like to like be, like I've never been to church. Um, but I kind of, I do have like a spiritual, you know, when I got sober, um, and I started going into the program, you know, there is a lot of talk about God, which at first freaked me out. Cause I was like, mm -hmm. no, 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 I'm not talking about God. Like this is like crazy Jesus shit. Um, but then as time went along, I found that, you know, you can kind of, everybody can make, can decide like what God means to them. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, like kind of tailor it to what helps them, I don't know, have like faith in the future and, you know, have gain a perspective that helps them like process life better. So for you, like what, what is God to you? Like specifically? Um, God to me is love. That's like, all I can explain is like love because I see, like, I look at my, my kids and I look at my daughter, looking at her eyes. It's like, you know, that is a gift from God to me. That's, that's what I feel it is. Um, I believe karma is part of God. You know, it's like, you get what you put out. I mean, um, if something, if you, if you are bad and evil towards people, I believe that comes back on you. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a part of God. Um, but my relationship with God has never changed. It's that it's like, I still feel that love. I've never felt that like judgment uh, or the, whatever you want to call the convictions and, and feel like I'm going to hell for things. It's like, I believe everybody makes mistakes. You know, I'm not perfect. I've never claimed to be perfect. Um, but I, one of the things I will say about, about church and stuff is when you're raised up in church and I wasn't raised up in church, but what they teach you is that you need to be like God. You need to be like Jesus. You got it. 
got to be like that. And when everybody's trying to be that perfect, you're going to fail because you're never Mm going to be like God. If, you know, God is the creator of everything, you're not going to be like that because that's perfection. So you're going to fail every time. And that's where the depression rolls in. And I feel like if you're in church and you're believing everything that you're hearing, you're going to be continuously depressed all the time. And if you, you know, step outside the box and start looking into everything, you know, go and research other religions and see what everybody else is believing and then form your own relationship with God, whether it's, you know, you don't have to call him Jesus. You don't have to call him whatever, just form your own relationship and make that what it is, make it what you want it to be, not what somebody else is forcing you to believe. Right. Do you believe in, in God in the way that they speak? speak of him in the Bible that like he's an actual entity and do you believe in that in Jesus and that Jesus was his son and, and died for the sins of man? I don't believe a lot of stuff in the Bible. There's so many contradicting things in there that doesn't make any sense. And, you know, people like, Oh, you know, like all they'll, they'll go back and start fighting on scriptures and stuff like that. And it's, it's like, yes, it is contradicting. There's a lot of unknown things There's that it's hard to believe. And look how many times the Bible has been rewritten. You know, it's mm-hmm. you go back during, you know, the whole King James. It's, it's like you have a king that took the Bible from the scrolls and made it into something he wanted it to be and then formed all these books and sent them out to everybody. And was like, okay, you got to believe exactly what it is when nobody else could read. Yeah. So it's like. What re- what is the true story here? Because I'm not going to send somebody to hell for not for wearing having a woman wear pants like that's ridiculous. But that's mm-hmm. what the Bible will teach you. So I don't I don't believe it all. Yeah. Do you believe in heaven and hell? Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, I do. And then, what do you believe constitutes somebody going to hell versus going to heaven? Um, I think going to heaven is a matter of your heart. You know, we all have done evil things. We all do good and bad and we all make mistakes. I think if you are a true evil person at heart, then you're going to hell. You know, Mm -hmm. I don't think that God's going to punish us for making mistakes. And I think that, you know, it's, you got, you have to be a good person and you'll, you'll know if you're a good person, you'll know by your heart. Yeah. I just, Sorry, this is this is something that I've always like thought about um, just because, again, like I wasn't raised in religion and I'm, I've always been interested in like kind of the science behind the way our brain works. And if like, do you believe that some people were born evil and if they were born evil, like didn't God make them evil? How like, do you know what I mean? Like, so then yeah. like, is that fair if God makes you evil and then you're evil and then you go to hell because you're a certain way that God makes you. I mean, when they, when they talk about like sociopaths and stuff like that, like there's been studies of people's brains that like, you know, certain parts of their brain like doesn't really function properly. So like they literally cannot experience empathy. Like yeah. how does that work in like a heaven and hell world? That, and you know, it's funny. So in college I did a paper, it was a 25 page paper that was born or made, it was called. And I was researching, you know, um, serial killers and, you know, their lives, like, uh, I think it was, who was a Jeffrey Dahmer where they, they, Mm -hmm. um, you know, went through his brain and everything. It was like, I believe if there's a little of each, you know, born or made, it's like their experiences is their brain or their experiences are things that happen during their life, whether they were beaten or, you know, somebody forced their children to have sex right in front of them or, you know, all the messed up things that can happen. And then, you know, there's, there are things where, you know, you're just born messed up. So I, I don't know. I I can't really say that I can answer that because I just don't know. But I, I believe that there's a little bit of each thing that happens to them when it comes to being evil. I think it's, yeah, it's usually, yeah, it's usually a combination of some kind of like chemical imbalance Mm -hmm. plus like horrible childhood. Yeah. I just, I mean, I don't. I don't have an answer either. It's just something I've always like thought about, like, you know, how does, how does that work? Like how much of us, like, I guess how much of our life is, is free will or or how much of us is just like pre-wired. And then like, we are the way that we are. Cause one of the things that, you know, I've really tried to evolve as a person in is like 
compassion and thinking about how people react to things and how people, everybody's kind of doing their best with the tools that they're given. And some people just don't have like the tools to process like life properly. Right. So like the way some people may react to you a certain way, which is completely unfair and unkind, but like, you know, they're literally stuck in this kind of brain pattern where they don't know like how to be any different. So, you know, since we can't change the way that people behave, like the only thing that is really in our power is how we react to things. So I just always kind of think about, you know, if this is a horrible person, they probably just don't have the tools, the knowledge, they didn't have the love and the support that like would be able to bring them to a place where they could change their behavior. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one of the things, um, I learned was, was sin is only when you act on it. You know, Mm -hmm. you can think about it, you know, like think about, you know, murdering somebody, but it only becomes a sin when you act on it. But then people will be like, Oh, you know, well, you know, the second thought is what, if you think about it twice, then you, you know, you're going to hell. So it's like, you know, it's, it's hard to learn any part of religion and then, you know, have these thoughts and, you know, wanting to be a normal person, but then you have all these evil sides to you mm-hmm. and you get confused. Cause you're like, do I act on this? Is this a bad thing? Is this a good thing? Am I going to hell? And you know, it's, it's definitely a world that I still think about every day. Like I think about these things a lot. I can't say every day, but I do think about them a lot because it's, it's an unknown world. You know, nobody has died and been dead for a week and come back and be like, Hey, this is what hell's like, or this is what heaven's like. It's like, no, you guys don't, you don't really know. You got to kind of learn your own ways and learn your own patterns and just try to be a good person. Yeah. I mean, that's a thing too. It's like another thing about religion that, that freaks me out is the whole like idea that, you know, you're going to go to hell and burn in hell for all eternity. If you don't like act this very specific way or dress this very specific way. I mean, what a manipulative tool to use to frighten people into submission. It's just like, it's so terrifying. I mean, and, and then it's like, so you live your whole life basically behaving in a certain way because like you fear, like this horrible afterlife. I just, I don't know. I can't imagine like being indoctrined in that way as a child to like, you know, live your life in like fear of, of hell. It's just like such a crazy idea to me. Right. It is insane to me too. It's like, it's nuts. No, if God loves you, why would he send you to hell to burn for the rest of your life? If God loves you. And then the, what, what the, some, some churches will teach you is like, Oh, if you don't go to church, if you don't go to church on Sunday, then you're going to be going to hell. It's like, I don't think so. I don't yeah. believe that God loves us. And then they're going to send us hell for not going and sitting into a, in a building for two hours every Sunday. No. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Right. And then, mm-hmm. and then what makes people think that their specific like religion niche of religion is the right one. What about all the other people who believe in God, but in a different way? Like, so they're all going to hell and like only you guys are going to be saved. Like, I don't know. That feels really narcissistic to me. Yeah. And that's, that's why I always tell people, I'm like, you know, go and research other religions because whether it's, you know, Christianity or Buddhism or, you know, Baptist or all, everything that's out there, Pentecostal, all this stuff, go and research all the different religions. Cause the more you learn, the more of an open mind you're going to have with things because Mm -hmm. I don't believe not one single religion is right. I think that everybody's got little pieces of them, but yeah, you know, there's good and bad with everything. I mean, I feel like ultimately, you know, we all need something to believe in that's like bigger than us because sometimes otherwise life just feels really like small and impossible and just this kind of, or, or even like big and impossible, you know, like you're just floating at sea rudderless and, and you just like, there's no point to anything. So I understand like that needing to feel like there's some kind of like divine order or divine power, or I don't know, someone, something or someone out there that's just like looking for you. Cause otherwise the world just feels like chaotic and insane. And And also too, you know, I can understand the roots of religion because before we had science to explain all of these natural phenomena, like I was watching a nature show last night and they showed the Northern lights, right. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think it was up in Iceland and it's like, how could you explain that if you didn't understand 
science now, you know, like we right. know what causes the Northern lights, like this, these atmospheric, um, situations, but like, it, you know, before that, like you see these crazy flashes, like, how could you not think that was God? Yeah. You know, like it, it, it just, have you read the Bible before? Like, uh, that'd be a no. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever book you? So you, have you ever read any part of it? Like the book of revelations? I have read. Yeah. So I was an English major. So, um, I have read the Bible in terms of like when it came, it was referenced in, in literature or something like that. But overall, like I've never like sat down and read the Bible. No. Mm -hmm. Well, the only thing that the, like, like I said, there's parts of the Bible I believe and some of it that I don't believe, but one of the big chapters I believe is, um, the book of revelations. Like there's a million different ways to interpret things, but um, part of it talks about the chip in the hand when, you know, the Antichrist is coming and stuff. And like, I think about, okay, how did back then they even know anything about there being an electronic chip in your hand, especially this is before electricity or anything else. And there, it literally predicts the future. There's a wait, lot wait, of parts wait. of it. Wait, hold on, hold on. In the Bible, <laughs> yeah. they talk about that there's an electronic chip in your hand. Yeah. They talk about it even being in, in your hand or in your forehead. Um, a chip and it's called the mark of the beast and, it's, and they're doing and this overseas and, wait and they called it electronic like before they, they didn't say they electronic existed? they said the mark of the beast and they said it's a chip wow that's crazy. it's it's pretty crazy i mean if you ever you know if you're ever going to read anything read the book of the revelations because that's that's isn't that like the I most mean, like, like violent and depressing and frightening part of the bible <laughs> No, I, oh my God, there's so many horrific things. I mean, there's rape, there's everything that happens in way, way before all that stuff. Jeez. But there's a lot in there where it's like, you know, children shouldn't even be reading this stuff. It's pretty bad. Yeah. So speaking of children, um, I know that you have a daughter um, mm -hmm. and you're worried about her finding out about your work because you don't want her to follow the same path. How do you, I, I don't say I'm not worried about her finding out about it. I just don't want her to follow the path that I, that I went. It's like, you know, that's the whole saying, do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, understandable. <laughs> so do you um, have, have you had a conversation with her about it yet? Or do you plan no, to? No, she's 10 months old. Oh, she's 10 months old. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, young for that. I have boys. So, um, <gasps> no, she, you know, I just, my life, I grew up with, going through some horrific things. You know, I was mm -hmm. molested as a child by a couple different people and just went down that path. You know, I, um, it's like for part of that born or made thing. It's like, I wonder where I would be at right now if I didn't mm -hmm. experience those things, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so I hope for the, you know, that bad things don't happen to her and she grows up in a more, um, you know, uh, a different environment like that where she doesn't have to experience those bad things and she has a choice to you know like i can help her going through college and stuff like that so she doesn't have to go through the path that i went through mm -hmm. and you... i had amazing parents don't 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 get me wrong my my mother is an amazing mother yeah yeah it's, it's hard right i mean it's like we want to protect our kids from everything in the world but mm -hmm. you know they have to have their own experience um, what about your, you said, you said you have boys too. What about your sons? How old are they? Um, the oldest is 21 and then I have a 12 year old and a six year old. Okay. So of course so, the six year old doesn't know about it, but uh, right. the 12 year old does. <laughs> and did you, yeah. did he find out or did you have a conversation with him about it? Um, I had a conversation with him about it, you know, um, so, um, same thing with my 21 year old, you know, I waited till, till I think he was 12 years old when I told him about it. But. And how did that go? Cause I just, I know that there's a lot of other sex workers who have children who are concerned about having that conversation with them and are always kind of like looking for advice on like the best way to approach that. Do you feel that the way that you handled it worked out and, and what would your advice be to other um, mothers? I would say, you know, like when I told my, my son about it, he was like, um, you know, he was going through, I think it was like fifth grade is when they now start the whole birds and the bees type of, uh, you know, mm -hmm. whole sex class that they have. So, you know, it was even older than that when I told him about it. Um, but I was like, yeah, so, you know, I kind of do that, you know, the boy and girl thing and I do it on film and, 
And he's like, what? I was like, I have sex on film. And he's like, ew, gross. You know, like that type of, you know. Which is a normal reaction for a kid. Yeah. Yeah. So um, in in his school, he had a lot of people, a lot of friends that knew who I was. So it, it was a good and bad thing because he had friends that would come over to the house just to see me and be like, oh, you know, you know, just as mom's hot, she's a MILF type of thing. And, and then he also got picked on for it. So mm-hmm. that's, that's hard too. Um, so for moms and, you know, even dads that are going through the same thing, I would just say, you know, just be upfront about it and not um, try to hide it once they get to a certain age. Cause that's, that can be a problem when you hide it and it becomes a lie and, you know, that's, that can be horrible, but um, I mean, my, my two kids, they seem to take it pretty well. So, yeah, I think the worst way to find out is like through a friend, right. Or like a scene on the internet or something like that. Like it's, you know, learning from your parents is really the best way to go, but I can imagine that that yeah. conversation is, is tricky. Oh yeah. It's definitely difficult, but I've, my, my kids, it's like, I have a very close relationship with them and you know, they can come and talk to me about anything, like things that they can't talk to their dad about, about, mm-hmm. you know, especially my 12 year old, he will, he talks to me about everything in his life. And it's like, he can come to me with stuff. And if, as long as you have that open communication with them, you know, it's like, you got to be a friend, a friend to them, but you also got to be a parent too. But mm-hmm. as long as you have that comfortable communication with them, I think that it'll go over fine. Right. Has your new, um, you know, return to OnlyFans and, and your platform there, has that enabled it you to like be more present as a mother because you kind of get to do things on your own time, right? Has that oh, made it yeah. easier for you? Oh, it's made it, um, it's, it's so much different. And it's like, I can, I can film and, you know, I don't have to travel, you know, out to LA to make film. It's like, I can, or, or, or pictures, you know, I can just take pictures and, you know, I could drop my daughter off to daycare and my son would be gone to school and, uh, you know, I can take pictures and stuff and, you know, come, you know, get my kid off the bus and be that normal mom, but, yeah. you know, and then have this crazy sex, you know, side to me. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's one thing that I've heard like so many mothers say that OnlyFans is, has been so great for them because it has enabled them to make their own schedule mm-hmm. and, and really be more present for their children which is, you know, something that, you know, we all, we all want, right. Mm-hmm. We want to work a cre- I was talking to my husband about this the other day. He works from home too. Um, as, as well as I do. And we were just saying how lucky we are that like, you know, we're able to be here and to be here for our daughter, you know, and he was like, you know, if I worked downtown, he was like, I would drive an hour downtown and then it would take me an hour to get back. He's like, I would never see the baby. He's like, I would mm-hmm. leave like you know, when she got up and I'd come home after she went to bed, he's like, I would never see her. So, you know, and especially in this post COVID world, I think people have really realized the importance of being able to work from home, which is something that only fans has afforded so many people. It's kind of remarkable. Yeah. COVID definitely changed the world in a lot of different ways and, you know, good and bad, but, um, working from home is just, it's, it's perfect for me, for my life. I mean, I still travel a lot too. Um, like I, and I still do, I still shoot me mainstream movies. So mm-hmm. there's still different things that I do besides just only fans. Right. But now so, it's like a different balance. Yeah. 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 So do you have any like regrets? I mean, looking back, you know, you had not a great experience in the adult industry in the beginning. Um, you left and you went to the church um, you left porn and then you, you came back to it, you know, under totally dis- different circumstances. You seem to be like in a good place now, you know, if you could start from the very beginning, would you do this like all over again or, or given the opportunity, would you never get in the porn industry? Um, I don't, I don't think that I would never get into it because it's just a part of me and who I am. I mean, if, I, you know, was reborn again, you know, and not been gone through the horrible, horrific things I was in and seeking the attention that I was seeking. Um, you know, I had what they call daddy issues. 
Mm-hmm. So I think if I didn't have all of them, I probably would have chosen a different path. But now looking back, it's like, you know, I'm glad I'm where I'm at now. I'm happy where I'm at now because I've seen all sides of it. I've seen the porn side. I've seen the religious side. And now it's like right in the middle. And I like where I'm at. Mm-hmm. Well, Crystal, thank you so much for coming on. Um, I appreciate your perspective. We had a, a fun little talk about religion. I don't usually get to get into it that deep, but um, I'm always like super curious about people who've been in the church, like their experience and, you know, people's evolution about, you know, how they feel about God. So, so thank you yeah, for awesome. all of that. Thanks so much. Um, can you tell everybody where they can find you online? Go ahead and plug your social media, anything else? Um, yeah, you can find me on uh, OnlyFans.com slash Nadia Hilton. Uh, it's N-A-D-I-A-H-I-L-T-O-N. And um, you can also look me up on Instagram. I actually just started get, get, got that back up. Um, Crystal D. Gregorio on Instagram. I have TikTok, too. I make funny videos on. <laughs> What's your TikTok? Um, it's Miss Nadia Hilton. Miss Na- M-I-S-S or yep. M-S? M-I-S-S. M-I-S-S. Okay, cool. And you guys can find me at uh, Holly Randall on Twitter and on Instagram. Um, I also have a TikTok, Holly Randall Unfiltered, where I pull little clips from my podcast. And of course, if you want to support the show, go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall Unfiltered. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Make sure that you go and join Nadia's OnlyFans or at least follow her on Instagram just so we can give her like a thank you for giving us her time, which we so appreciate. Thank you guys so much. And I'll see you next week. Manscaped has the men's grooming market down pat. Their Lawnmower 4.0 is the most revolutionary body hair trimmer on the market. They've also just launched their shampoo and conditioner, which is designed to help hydrate, nourish, and keep the hair that you want to keep on your head staying strong. Manscaped is really the one-stop shop for all your men's grooming needs. So go to manscaped.com and use code HRU for 20% off plus free shipping.